शिव शिव सर्वेश्वराय शंभो शंभो महाधे
Namaskaram. Namaskaram to all of you, wherever you are. <coughs> well, if you are... particularly if you're in India, as you know that uh, this pandemic numbers are uh, hitting real highs, nearly seventy-seven thousand in the last twenty-four hours, new cases, over a thousand deaths. In many ways, uh, I think leading the world in the numbers. This may also be because the testing is happening over a million per day. But the silver lining is the recovery rate is very good. But the challenge is not only of death. The challenge is of ill health, which may persist. Psychological struggles that people go through, because of isolation, I have dozens and dozens of people every day informing me about how uh, their father died of virus and they could not go to attend to him when he was alive during his last days, nor could they go to attend to his last rites. Brothers, sisters, mothers, children being lost and not even able to be there to find some kind of emotional closure to these losses. So these are hard times, challenging times. Apart from that, economic challenges, loss of livelihood, closure of thousands of businesses, over nineteen million job losses in India alone, similar things happening in most other countries. Well, this is where we are right now. And as <laughs> As all of you know by now, the UN agencies are saying, uh, the pandemic could last for two years. <clears throat> well, I've been saying that too, it may go down in its intensity or our ability to handle it may get enhanced, but it could last for twenty-four months or thirty months, very much a possibility. We have to come to terms with a, a new… with new parameters of life. When I say new parameters, if you lived here hundred, two hundred or let's say five hundred years ago, I've, uh, you know, like I've been around uh, when uh, my great-grandmother was talking to her uh, friends who were of similar age or little less than her. All of them at some point discussing uh, in their life how many children they have lost. Almost all of them had definitely buried their husbands I, no, no, I'm not saying they did, but <laughs> they attended to their death, did not facilitate. And children lost many other people who were dear to them, way younger than them. They lost in their life. So this has been the history of humanity that every generation people had deaths all around them. As if that was not enough, wars, famines, pestilence did things of their own. As you have heard from history books that whenever 
raids and wars happened, terrible things that happened to men and women and children, villages and towns burned down, all this. In that sense, we are a very fortunate generation that such things have not been happening to us. I know if I say this, I will be very unpopular, but you know I am known for this, to say unpopular things, which will be accepted after some time, later. In that sense, as a generation of people, the hit that we are taking in the... in terms of this pandemic is a soft hit. Well, immediately if you're getting bristled up, how can you say this, I lost somebody dear to me, I lost my friend, I lost my business, I know that, I very much empathize with that. But just look back and see, eight years ago, World War II, what those people went through, we have not seen anything like that. We have not seen such horrors. But they survived, they came out of it strong, created nations, built cities back, almost like it did not happen. Today, if you travel through Europe, which was the heart of World War II or World War I, you don't see a sign of war. This is what human beings are capable of, this is what we must look at. Because people are predicting a mental health pandemic, suicide pandemic. I hope nobody here is complaining or planning mental health issues as a part of your pandemic menu, at least in the yoga center <laughs> Because uh, it's very easy to fall into that pit, very, very easy. All I have to do is withdraw into a corner and think everything is going wrong. It is, many things are going wrong, but we are still alive, so nothing is really wrong with our lives. Do not misunderstand social arrangements, psychological and emotional, emotional, psychological and emotional situations as life. Uh, this is the decor of life. Minus the decor, life is still on. So, now that uh, I'm here in the United States and travel <laughs> doesn't look very attractive, getting into a plane I think is the worst thing to do right now. I'm not fit enough to swim back to India. So, <laughs> we thought we will make the best use of it. I must tell you this, uh, probably in uh, probably 2000, 2001 or maybe 2000, in the year 2000 or 2001, I'm not very clear about that. <clears throat> Post uh, Dhyanalinga, when, uh, uh, when people were doubting whether I will live or not, at that time, I took a break and spent some time in the, the center, near the Center Hill Lake. One of our meditators had a beautiful home there and uh, we spent a week or so uh, trying to recover and at the same time I was writing something, so we needed time in a place where there was not much disturbance, phone, phones would not work and I wanted a place where phones don't work. <coughs> so as a part of this, when I was there, I just walked off into the forest. I will... Um, I will entertain the Americans by calling it woods. <laughs> I walked away among the woods, really tall trees. And I was just walking there and uh, I saw something which 
uh, will not make logical sense to you, but probably in my life, not probably, I'm quite certain, that was one of the most painful moments in my life because it, it hurt me so deeply looking at this. At that time I wrote a poem called America. I was just beginning to come to United States at that time. When I saw this, I saw this as a kind of a, a monumental pain established in a certain way. Let me read this to you. <clears throat> it's called America. The brooding darkness of these woods fed upon the native blood. In the twisted tangle of the fallen wood, the spirit of the fallen Indian stood. O oh, brothers, your identity a mistake. Those who oceans cross did make, the greed for gold and land laid waste the spirit of wisdom and grace. The children of those who by murder did take are taintless of their forefathers' mistake. But those who lived fed upon the milk of courage and pride stand as spirits of defeat and shame. Oh, the murdered and the murderous, embrace me, let me set your spirits to rest. Well, since then I've been thinking we should explore a little bit of the Native American culture, their spirituality, their occult, their rituals and practices. We made a few trips in certain regions, but never a comprehensive trip, never really managing to pay enough attention to it, though in many different ways, from various different directions. This influence has come towards me because of a horribly uh, crazy schedules every time I come. And sometimes I'm in three different cities on the same day. <laughs> Virus has put us to rest. So, now we are uh, thinking of uh, doing this. We will do this sometime in September. That is uh, because uh, this is the nature of this culture is such. Maybe <laughs> almost all of you, at least in this part of the world, and nobody has gone without uh, hearing the song of Bob Dylan about uh, blowing in the wind. That blowing in the wind term comes from Native American culture where it's always about feeling the wind and sensing what is happening around you. I've spoken about this in the past when I was in a certain part of Canada, north of Vancouver. We were just driving to see how the terrain is, not going anywhere in particular, we drove up uh, probably a couple of hundred miles. And there, there was a one really beat up pickup truck and there was a young woman who was uh, like filling gas into this truck, who uh, was from the Nati Native American, uh, one of the Native American tribes there. And there was a, her father, an older person. So I also went and parked my car to fill up. And uh, I looked at him and our eyes locked up. Then he said, the winds have been telling me of your coming brother. Well, we connected in a certain way and we, we went in different ways. So in that sense, uh, without being in touch with the wind, the earth, you can't really explore this culture. So I decided now that in the month of September, we will be riding on a motorcycle covering over sixteen states in United States of the fifty. 
<coughs> probably covering eleven to... I mean ten to eleven thousand kilometers, probably six thousand to six thousand miles. It may become much more depending upon how much interest we develop in various things or how much is still left to fill out from that place. Because the building of the new nation has taken away many things. So we don't want to just dwell on the past, we also want to focus on how in the last two hundred years, people managed to build a whole new civilization. A very prominent nation in the world, their struggles, their fights, their longing for a new opening and various things. Essentially, we want to focus on human beings who made this land what it is and what it was. The culture of what you call as Native Americans goes back a very long time. <clears throat> the circumpolar culture as it is known, that is somewhere between ten to forty thousand years, this migration has happened from Central Asia, Siberia, northernmost regions from Greenland, Scandinavia, Northern Asia and Siberia, this whole circumpolar migration that happened. The way the Native American people and the people of Tibet, Mongolia, Siberia are connected, these people walked probably when the Bering Sea was frozen in winters, they walked. Probably the Scandinavian cold felt like warmth for those who lived in Siberia. So they walked across most probably in winters. Today's understanding of archaeology says, it could have started forty thousand years ago or more. So this is not something a single migration must have happened as a trickle from Canada or northernmost part of Canada down to South America. Over three hundred tribes or nations existed at one time. Well, today the whole geography has changed in many ways, but these are cultures Except for some of the South American tribes, these are cultures which largely followed uh, a nomadic way of life, a little bit of scratching the earth in the form of agriculture, but mostly hunters and gatherers whose life moved with the mobile food that they had. For example, in Northern America, the tribes moved with the movement of buffaloes because that was their food, wherever they went, they went. They harvested them in a wise manner without destroying the herds. But those things have changed today, you don't see any buffalo. <laughs> you don't hear the buffalo tremors in the Tennessee land. And uh, most of you are very happy about that. You wouldn't like to be knocked down by a buffalo. But these are the tragedies we have unfolded on the planet, that life in its full vigor has been taken out and uh, we have created an artificial cell of life. In creating this artificial cell, much suffering has come. When I say much suffering has come, well, the best way for you to understand right now is uh, the virus, the pandemic. Pandemics have happened in the past also, for a variety of reasons which are not in our control. But 
pandemic, pandemics may also be instigated by destruction of habitat for microorganisms, it's possible. I'm saying if there were enough bats and pangolins and bisons or buffaloes, probably they wouldn't bother to jump to new terrain. It's just like how human beings move from one place to another when they feel suffocated in their existing terrain. If uh, England was not an island, suppose there was a way to grow the land like you grow trees, maybe people wouldn't have taken the trouble of navigating across oceans to come to America. Only because the habitat, the existing habitat felt suffocating, longing to f go and find new land or new terrain becomes important in every life's way. No life simply migrates. Life migrates because in some way the existing terrain is insufficient or in some way it's not able to fulfill their aspirations of whatever that is. So, once again looking at these cultures, looking at their way of life, their way of addressing their spirituality, their way of organizing their religion may become very important in the world because people who are taught this is a most disastrous idea, heaven. Because people who are taught there is a better place somewhere else, here we laid this land waste. One important part of these cultures is the land itself is God. Sky is God, land is God, water and wind is God. Well, these things have been dismissed off as paganism or uh, animistic form of worship, but this is important. Instead of being an environmentalist, you must understand land is God because it is the source of your life right now, the very source of your body, the very body that you carry is land. So, bringing this back in a modern context, above all, if you want to experience these things, you must be open to the wind and land because we can't do this journey horseback. We are going on motorcycles, not too many, just enough to shoot. We will capture this uh, maybe a couple of weeks or more. Uh, Covering this ten, eleven thousand kilometers, mm. all this uh, you will be able to follow online on the social media. Short clips will go, and little longer clips will go on the app, Sadhguru app. So, if you wish to follow this for this uh, journey of maybe fifteen to twenty days. You must have the app and later on, more elaborate part of this, we, we believe we should be shooting anywhere between thirty-five to fifty hours of material which could become twelve to fifteen hours of edited material. So that will go on Sadhguru exclusive. The idea is to address dimensions of life which need not necessarily be logically correct. Our education systems, in trying to be logically correct, have cut out human experience out of human, ed you know, human education. Education has completely taken away human experience. Education is all about information. Information that you cannot relate to, no wonder you go about making predictions of mental health pandem pandemics, because you become purely intellectual and logical, you have no profound experience of life. So it's important to bring back the significance of these cultures. The fallacy of these cultures, the lacuna of these cultures, at the same time 
the strength of these cultures because they survived for thousands of years. Though genetically, ethnically, they all about the same, still three hundred nations or three hundred tribes, without a geographical location because they are nomadic in nature, moving around, a general area but no fixed location, they maintain their distinct identities for thousands of years. If tribes have to maintain their distinct identity for thousands of years, obviously they had a very individual tribal experience, that their tribe's experience of life, their way of looking at nature, their way of articulating various dimensions of what they thought was natural and supernatural was very different. That is why they could maintain their identity separately. Otherwise, very easily they could have merged as one. Today, well, uh, today in the modern world people say, Indians <laughs> Hey, I'm the real Indian, okay <laughs> They are a mistake that Columbus made. Uh, because he wanted to go to India and he landed up in America. That's a big mistake, huh? You want to go east but you went west, that's a huge mistake. Uh, <laughs> uh, but they got labeled as Indians because people who came from outside had no patience to look at the intricacies of their culture, why they are who they are. So we will see whatever is left, we will try to explore this to whatever extent we can. I will all feel the wind for sure, so uh, because we are riding on motorcycles. Mm. I'm excited, I hope you are <laughs> Please if there are questions. You can only follow virtually. That's a new situation in the world. Dearest Sadhguru, it is your birthday in four days on the 3rd of September. It's, it's not clear to me, please. <laughs> and I am very excited about it. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what no, I could... No, I don't know what you're excited about. <laughs> I'm not able to hear. <laughs> I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what I could gift you, but in vain. Can you please guide me on what I could do for you for this birthday? Please. I didn't understand. What… what they want to give me? Can you please guide me on what I could do for you this birthday? Oh, on my birthday? What do you want to do? I'm already born <laughs> Oh, okay. Okay, okay, I'm sorry <laughs> Yes, you… if you can. It is your birthday in four days on the 3rd of September and I am very excited about it. Oh. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what I could gift you, but in vain. Can you please guide me on what I could do for you this birthday? See, excitement about birthday is probably when you're sixteen or eighteen because uh, maybe uh, you get your driving license, you're on your own. Because you turned eighteen, your mother can't ask, where did you go? Where were you all this time? Because I'm eighteen. So those were exciting birthdays maybe. At that time I didn't even notice which day is my birthday uh, because I would be somewhere and I wouldn't even know. Now, uh, uh, birthdays uh, beyond a certain age is like a countdown <laughs> for you to take off. So, what will you do? Anyway, let me make use of it because you want to do something. I'm interested in people who want to do something, not for me, but you're interested in doing something now that you're asking. Is this from India or here? I don't know. Okay. <clears throat> well, what you could do is uh, the third of September, we are seeing uh, how to make this the River Re Revitalization Day. Rally for Rivers was flagged off on 3rd September. 
that was, you know, this was, this, this was my plan to avoid birthday parties. Kaveri calling was flagged off on 3rd September. And Kaveri calling as, uh, if you have followed as you would know, ah, I was soaked to the bone every day because of heavy rains and motorcycle. So my birthday was a really soaking birthday last time because uh, we were in Kurg and the monsoon peaked out at that time. And phew, those of you who have not seen monsoon in the Western Ghats, you must someday see, it's like sheets of rain. Like literally like, you know, the word downpour, most appropriate in that situation. <laughs> it's not like rain drops coming down, it's like sheets of rain coming down. And we were riding in those conditions. It was like back to my early twenties time when I was constantly riding in those kind of conditions. Anyway, so this year we are pushing towards this to slowly establish this as a river revitalization day. As a part of this, uh, we have a conversation, a live conversation with the Minister of Environment in the federal government in, of India, the central government. Why this is uh, because Kaveri calling has been a, a massive success in spite of the pandemic. We lowered our goals a little bit thinking the pandemic may affect us, but our fantastic volunteers, their dedication and commitment, the enthusiasm of the local farmers, and above all, the support that the state government offered in the form of subsidies for the farmers and uh, the Karnataka State Forest Department provided massive amount of saplings, so, eleven million saplings are being planted this year in private lands, you must understand this. Farmers are taking high-value timber trees and taking it on their land. That means for sure they will survive, because for every surviving tree over a period of four years, there is a subsidy, there is a certain financial assistance. Having said that, uh, I gave a call to the youth in India that three years of your life, if you dedicate for this cause, we will revive the rivers. That was a big thing to say. So a little over three hundred youth, many of them resigned well-paying jobs, some of them dropped their PhD pursuits halfway, some of them, anyway, are dropouts. <laughs> they were not fitting into the university, they were looking for a universe for themselves. So, uh, over three hundred of them dedicated their lives for this cause for three years. Now I have the responsibility and onus not only not to disappoint the farmers and above all, Kaveri, and many world bodies which are all looking at this project with great hope because never before anything like this has been done. Repeatedly, many leaders in the world bodies have told me, Sadhguru, if you pull this off successfully, this will be a game changer for the tropical world and in turn for the entire world. Because if you do not know this, a tree planted in tropical land is about six to eight times more effective in terms of carbon sequestering and fixing of the climate change than when it is planted above thirty-three degrees latitude. So they are seeing this as a game changer. So we don't want to fail, we want to win the game because this is not about us. This is not about a few of us or a few hundred of us who are working on this. And as you know, the contributions for Kaveri calling for this forty-two rupees per sapling call when it was given came from one hundred and twenty-two countries. 
and over eighty-two percent of them had nothing to do with Isha as an organization, these are just people. So that is the level of enthusiasm and trust that they have placed in us and above all the farmers because... Uh, is it still working? Okay. Above all the farmers because their lives in the last fifty years has not been good at all. That is, in the last twenty-two years over three hundred thousand farmers have committed suicide. People have been asking me, Sadhguru, why did you take up this cause? Why so much involvement? Said if three hundred thousand lives committing suicide doesn't get you into action, I don't know what. I don't know what else we are waiting for. Maybe we have a way of getting used to every kind of tragedy. Please understand this, getting used to a horrible situation is not transformation is not freedom, it's just lethargy of life. You got used to people dying all around you, it's okay, they die. This is not in any way that you are spiritually evolved and nothing touches you. No, nothing touches you because life has not touched you. Life should touch you. You say... you call it a birthday, all right? Birth means life touched you, that is birth. Only because life touched you, birth happened. Now that it's happened and uh, you believe in celebrating that every year, let's put it to good use, Kaveri calling. In spite of the pandemic, with great enthusiasm it's been on the ground, I'm putting these young people's lives to risks, risk though we are maintaining strict protocols, but still they're out there traveling and doing things. Fortunately, not one of them has come down with infection, nobody has tested positive yet. But the way it is spreading, who knows? But they are putting their life to risk and make things happen. So the onus is also on me to ensure these young people who are dedicating three years of their life, their three years does not go waste unless we are able to make them do something more wonderful than what they would have done by themselves. We have no right to call for anybody's lives. So, uh, in this context, now I have found you who wants to do something for my birthday. There is a lot to be done. How much of it can you swallow, please? that much you swallow. Because yesterday night I had a, a late night call with the Kaveri calling panel, all of them are trying to do their best. But I want you to understand the scale of this project, it's eighty-three thousand square kilometers of land, 5.2 million farmers and various struggles and thresholds to cross. This needs a continuous throttle-on kind of situation. And the time that it gives you to raise, to plan and to plant is a very challenging process. Raising saplings takes a minimum of eight months, minimum eight months, up to ten, eleven months. Planting needs to happen within two months span of monsoons, Another, a smaller monsoon happens, which is called as the northeast, little later in the year. But the real thing is only July, August, September. Already 8.3 million saplings have been taken by the farmers. This time the monsoon has been little late. So, this were 11 million saplings will go away very soon. We could have done more, but we were concerned with the pandemic on whether we will be able to, you know, really inspire people to take this on because we could not physically go to many villages as we had planned. There was supposed to be an inspiring tour that I was supposed to make in the villages of these two states, which I did not make 
largely using technology and WhatsApp groups and things like that, they're inspiring the farmers, which is uh, not an easy thing to do. Uh, but it is being done wonderfully well. Every one of you who have some concern for life, when you celebrate a birthday, this means you have some, some sense of celebration about life. If you have some sense of celebration for what life is, then you must do this to whatever extent you can. Uh, it's not for me to tell you do this much or that much, but this must happen in a recurring way. Every one of you who are with us right now on this uh, darshan, you do something. One tree a month, five trees, ten trees, hundred trees, whatever your capacity, but do it in a recurring manner, not one time and forget, because one thing is it must be on your consciousness, this is very important. Forty-two rupees, uh, you <laughs> In United States, you can't buy nothing for that, sixty cents. I don't think even the beggar will take sixty cents from you. He also puts up a board, five dollars. Yes. <laughs> even in India, forty-two rupees doesn't even buy you a coffee anymore. So, money is not the issue. What has been missing is human concern and care. As a generation of people, let's show that if you're concerned about celebrating my birthday, you must understand it is the birthday which is important. Birthday means beginning of life. If you are so inspired about the nature of life, because that's all we have, you may think you have many, many things, you have your lumps of gold, <laughs> carry it on your head now. You have wealth, you have bank balance, you have billions of dollars. No, no, only thing you have is life. Because you have life, you're pretending to have all these things. The only thing and really the only and only thing you have is life. We'll do one thing, if you don't understand what I'm saying, let's take your life out, then enjoy the billions and the lump of gold on your head. <laughs> That's the only thing we have. So, Kaveri calling is a committed celebration of life because without water, without soil, there is no life. Let's make it happen. If you want to use my birthday, as uh, as an inspiration, I'm fine. I don't mind celebrating birthday every day of the year. Hello? Really, why just September 3rd? If you want, I will do it 4th also, 5th also, <laughs> December 3rd also. I'm, o I'm okay, I'm willing, I'm saying. If you are willing, please let's make this happen, this is very important. This is not my work, this is not Isha Foundation's work. This is a generational work, we must make this happen, it's very important. This question is from the Department of Integrative Medicine, Nimhans, Bangalore. Namaskaram Sadhguru, sometimes spiritual experiences seem to involve a weakening of the ego, which may appear similar to psychosis. Like Ramakrishna Paramahamsa was called a mad priest, due to his ability of seeing Ma Kali. How can we differentiate a patient suffering from mental illness from a spiritually advanced personality? Similarly, we do see patients who practice unsupervised advanced kundalini yoga practices and then end up developing mental illnesses. What may be the best yogic way of dealing with such patients? Oh, first thing is, uh, will you be able to identify between those who are spiritually mad and just regularly mad. <laughs> the identity or how to identify this? Well, Nimhans Institute is a premier institute in the world, in Bangalore, and uh, 
I know they have done tremendous amount of work for the mental health of, I don't know, millions of people probably. It's one of the prime institutions in southern India at least. So, how to identify and then how to treat? Now one does not need treatment. Those who are spiritually mad don't need treatment, they need an ambience to establish their madness. Right now their madness may be a little erratic, they need to get well established in their madness. Let's understand the word madness. Madness means essentially anything that is not logic... If somebody speaks or does something which is not logically correct in your understanding, immediately you will say he's crazy. So anything that does not fit into your understanding of life, anything that does not fit into your logical limitations is madness in your understanding. Many of you think your children are mad. Children know that you are mad. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, uh, how do you identify someone who may be uh, well, you're talking about dissolution of ego, okay, that's how if you want to see it. Essentially, why a person on the spiritual path may look little mad to somebody is because of the sense of abandon, which is... Uh, I mean, the words that you put in terms of dissolution of ego just means that in a way, that there is a sense of abandon. That means you're kind of not too concerned about what happens to this one. Well, when I say what happens to this one, this is one thing that you can be sure of. People who are in mental conditions, that is mental illnesses, or those who are under influence of narcotics or alcohol or something, they also lose their logical sense, but in a destructive way, that is, when somebody is on LSD or somebody is in a mentally deranged state, they could easily cause physical harm to themselves. But one who is spiritually crazy will never cause spiritual... I mean, physical harm to themselves. I'm saying they're smartly mad. They are only dismantling the mental structures. They know clearly that physical structure cannot be dismantled because if you dismantle it, you can't put it back. But a mentally deranged person does not know this. One under... one who is under the influence of narcotics do not know this. They can physically dismantle themselves in the sense there have been many cases where drunken people or drugged people or even mentally deranged people have jumped off buildings or mountains or whatever high places. That never will happen with a spiritually crazy person because they clearly understand what needs to be dismantled is only the mental structure. You cannot dismantle the physical structure because if you undo the physical structure, you can't put it back. So that is one sign. When there is no any kind of sign of causing physical damage to oneself, that is one sign. Another thing is, if someone is mentally deranged, one thing is they cannot sit still. But one who is spiritually crazy, if you make, make him or her sit still, they will sit still for hours on end. So these two can be kind of guiding factors. If you ask someone to simply sit still with eyes closed, that is not possible for one who is in a mentally uh, aggrieved or exaggerated state of mental, uh, you know, activity. Sitting still, closing eyes won't come. But it is good to avoid spiritual madness also 
because then you will need an ambience of caring people who understand what's happening within you and create a protective atmosphere. So going spiritually crazy, those days are gone. You need to be just little crazy in your head, but very balanced and sane in the world. Otherwise, it's not going to work because there is no supportive atmosphere like that anymore. Even here, these days, nobody takes it <laughs> So, what or how can we treat them? Well, if one is spiritually evolving and at a certain moment or a certain stage of evolution, one looks little out of sorts, please don't treat them because treatment means, what treatment will you give? Generally, the treatment is only of sedation, bringing down life. No, that's not the way forward. Definitely, that is not the way to handle this. I must tell you this, uh, this happened many, many years ago. The doctors in Nimhan, I'm saying this with utmost regard and respect for your work, because I know how many lives you have transformed and how many lives you've saved from total derangement. So there was a, a young boy in Bangalore and uh, he was only seventeen or seventeen years of age I think at that time. So he became mentally imbalanced and uh, he was admitted to your institution, Nimhans. I'm talking about late seventies. Uh, he was admitted to your uh, uh, institution for I don't know, maybe two weeks or three weeks or something like that. Then uh, he came back quite normal and fine, just as crazy as a seventeen-year-old should be. <clears throat> but the local boys wouldn't leave him alone. They went on saying, "Hey, you went to Nimhans, you're crazy. Because in uh, Karnataka at least, who generally youth who know about Nimhans, uh, if they want to insult somebody, they say, oh, he's a Nimhan's case. That means he's lost his mind. So they went on harassing him that, you been admitted to Nimhan, so you're mad. So one day this boy came, I don't know if it was a genuine thing or he wrote it up himself, I'm not sure about that. He came and pulled out a paper and he said, see, I have a certificate from Nimhan's that I'm normal, do you have? Of course, nobody else had <laughs> So, thank you for all the work that you're doing and uh, the chances of spiritually crazy people coming to you are very, very, very remote unless there is a very aggressive and uh, inhospitable atmosphere around them and somebody catches hold of them and brings them to you. By themselves they will not come because they are not suffering it, first of all. But there could be other kinds of people who come that they did spiritual practices irresponsibly by reading a book or taking wild instructions from somewhere and doing their own thing and they lost their mind. They're just crazy. There are many ways to go mad. Every human being has a thousand opportunities opportunities in a day to pull their mental structure down and become deranged. Yes, you can think yourself into madness in so many different ways because the line between sanity and insanity is so thin in everybody's mind, I'm telling you. It is extremely thin, if you push it, you may cross. So. People doing improper spiritual practices and losing their mind and coming, don't treat them as spiritually crazy, they are not spiritually crazy. They use spirituality to go crazy, but they are just mentally deranged. They must be treated as you medically feel it is fit to treat them, depending on what level of imbalance they have. So being in a state of abandon and people mistaking that you're crazy is different than doing improper spiritual practices. Improper intellectual activity can lead to madness, 
Similarly, improper spiritual practices can lead to madness. Improper physical activity can lead to madness. If you just breathe in certain ways, you could lose your mind. There are ways to do this. <laughs> this is not a time to instruct you in those things. <laughs> Why? <laughs> why we are taking so much care about how to breathe, taking hours and hours to teach you a simple pr way of breathing is, because our breath, how we breathe could... and our physical body, how we move it, what we do, could decide the chemical nature of our existence. The chemical nature of our, ex chemical nature of our existence will in many ways, and as you know as doctors, definitely determines our mental status, whether we are sane or insane. If there is even a branding like that, in the society there may be, but I don't think medically there is a clear-cut branding that somebody is sane, somebody is insane. The question is only, some people are in a socially accepted level of madness, some people have crossed that. So what is crazy, what is not crazy, is more a social description, not really a scientific description as such. So, uh, this process of treating people according to their problems or according to their sufferings is uh, left to you, but either doing wrong type of physical activity, mental activity or spiritual activity can cause derangement of mind. So, uh, this is what yoga is about to even learn to sit properly. <laughs> you know how long it takes <laughs> to make people understand how to sit properly. Oh, it's unbelievable. So-called well-educated, intellectually sharp people, it takes so long to make them understand how to sit. How to breathe is many, many more years. How to keep your mental structure, oh, that's another thing. This, uh, as uh, medical professionals working in this region, we would like to work with you if that is necessary, but you yourself can do this probably. How to bring certain aspects of yogic culture into our education systems in the world is most vital. That is, uh, if you... if you want less number of people coming into these institutions, so that these institutions are kept for those people who most need it, not all kinds of frivolous people entering and taking that space. This needs to happen. Only then, those who really need it can get a good level of or a high level of uh, treatment. Time up. So, uh, those of you uh, who are going to virtually, I'm, I'm saying this again, virtually follow us through uh, this trip, Trans-American trip. We are uh, making this series because this has been on my mind for quite some time that we must explore the spiritual traditions of various parts of the world, of various cultures and uh, uh, tribes and variety of people who live in this world have different forms of accessing the same thing. So we are calling this uh, as uh, of motorcycles and a mystic because we won't stop with America, be with us. And also tomorrow is the Onam festival. For all the Malayali people, people from Kerala, my Puduvarsha Asamsangal, I hope I said that right, because I learned this almost uh, maybe thirty-five years ago. I have not used this word, Pudu Varsha Asam Sangal. I think I'm right. <laughs> anyway, you know, well, <laughs> my heart is with you and I wish you even if I said it wrong. <laughs>